years where we're pretty busy. Sorry to interrupt, John. Okay, well, I've got 10 o'clock. And so I would like to bid everyone hello and welcome you all to the Scottish American History Forum. I know we're gonna have late joiners as we always do over the next five minutes, but I wanna go ahead and get started. And um, I'm Connie Nestor and have had the pleasure of sharing the history forum for almost 12 years now. And I think as many of you already understand, the Scottish American History Forum is part of the Arts and Cultural Division of the Illinois St. Andrew, uh, I'm sorry, of Chicago Scots and what was formerly the Illinois St. Andrew Society, which founded the oldest 501c3 charity in the state of Illinois way back in 1845, later named Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care, which is located in North Riverside, Illinois, and continues to provide assisted living, shelter care, memory care, and independent living services on a homey, picturesque, wooded Scottish campus. And Chicago Scots is an organization that is dedicated to the nurturing of Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and celebration of our Scottish culture, in addition to support of the Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care Mission. So for additional information, we hope you'll all go to our website, www.chicagoscots.org, and please give generously to our Caledonia Senior Care Charity. It's a one of a kind mission that all Scots can be proud of. And as I was mentioning to Dr. Nicholson earlier, we're rapidly becoming a global organization for which membership is free. So I would encourage you all to go onto our website and join and start to be a part of our community. Now, before we go too much further, I just wanna make sure we've welcomed all of our international and out of staters. So I wanna do a little bit of a roll call and it may be a little early, but um, who, I, Dr. Nicholson obviously is from Scotland, but who else is on from Scotland today? Phil, um, are you a colleague, a student or what, what have, or what? I am Dr. Nichols, one of Dr. Nicholson's PhD uh, students. Oh, marvelous. Well, welcome, welcome. Anyone Thank else you. on from Scotland at the moment besides Dr. Nicholson? Okay, and we have several on from New York, I mean, from North Carolina, John Manchester and Randy and Don McLeod. Uh oh, sorry, I thought I had that off. Um, anyone else on from North Carolina? Actually, John Manchester is still from Island Lake. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, John. What about John Cameron? He's muted. Well, I'm just wondering. I'm, I'm in Chicago. Oh, you're, you're in Chicago. Do we have any, any other out of staters today? Uh, Michigan, Florida, Virginia, anybody on yet? Canada? I'm Sue Parsons and I'm calling in from Boston. Lovely, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Richards says hello from Maine. Beautiful. Thank you for joining. Yes, we're just about to inter begin interfacing with your Maine Ulster Scots project. So we're very excited about that. Well, I, I'll, um, I think I'll stop there. And I just want to, again, provide a, a very hearty welcome to everyone. We're so glad to have you all with us today. And um, prior to beginning our presentation with Dr. Nicholson, who will entertain a question and answer uh, uh, discussion process after his talk this morning, we are delighted, I see, that Gus Noble has joined us. 
Gus is president of Caledonia and Chicago Scots. And he's with us today to greet everyone. And I would like to mention Gus Noble OBE because Queen Elizabeth, by the way, did bestow the order of the British Empire upon Gus. And so Gus is going to update us a little bit on Caledonia and what's going on with Chicago Scots. And Gus, I, I know you're out with the family, but please, uh, please proceed. Thank you, Connie. I, I uh, echo your thanks to everybody from joining us uh, around the, the country and across uh, in Scotland. And uh, I, I want to first begin with an apology that I'm out and about, and therefore uh, there's lots of background noise, there's traffic, there's indeed a helicopter flying overhead to, to monitor traffic or something. So I, I apologize for any background noise. Um, I, I wanted to, to mention one, one event that's coming up that I'm uh, honored to be part of. There is a, an organization just northwest of the city of Chicago called Judson University. And they are uh, um, organizing a World Leaders Forum. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, in a, a series of these forum that they've organized featuring presidents, both presidents Bush, Condoleezza Rice, um, Gorbachev spoke at it, um, and Tony Blair spoke at it while he was prime minister. And it's Scotland that's in their focus this time. And they have two world leaders speaking. One is uh, Sir James Macmillan, the, the uh, acclaimed classical composer, and the other is the Lord Smith of Kelvin, uh, who was uh, chair of the organizing committee for Glasgow's 2014 Commonwealth Games. Both are part of an organization in Edinburgh called the Eric Liddell Community. And this was started by uh, Eric Liddell and his family. Eric Liddell, of course, the, the uh, Olympian uh, who won the gold medal in 1924 coming up on 100 years and was then a missionary. Uh, he, they've created a center that really leans in and, and, and does some amazing work in dementia care and therefore their fellow travelers with us at Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. Uh, so they're, they're here to talk about their careers, their work uh, in, in the civic world, but also in a world which we care deeply about. And I'm honored that I've been asked to facilitate a, a discussion between the two. That will be on the 21st of March, uh, coming up in a, a week or so. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to be there in, in all my tartan, and I encourage everyone to come in theirs and give the, the folks from Scotland a good Scottish welcome. Um, I'm also really interested uh, to hear from uh, Colin today, and uh, I'm interested because of the subject, but also because I am a, a Stirling graduate and, and proud to be one. So thanks for giving me a few minutes of your time this morning, and thanks, Connie, for handing the programme over to me briefly. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Gus. And Gus, do you mind just sharing a little bit about the upcoming festival with everyone? Because I, we'd love to have some out-of-staters this year. Sure, we, we uh, have in June, Father's Day weekend, third weekend in June in Itasca, or as we call it for the weekend, Itasca. <laughs> there. Um, we have the Scottish Festival and Highland Games, which is our 37th annual. Uh, it's promises to build on last year's success uh, when we had the biggest bagpiping championship in North America. And uh, this year we've added a grade one uh, competition. So we're getting the best pipe bands in the world coming. Um, I'm sure we'll have one of the biggest uh, Scottish festivals in the Midwest. All are welcome, all are encouraged to come. And if, if you're not Scottish by birth, or by heritage, be Scottish by inclination for at least a day and a half in June. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for making the time, Gus. And as always, you're a source of inspiration to us. So we thank you for your leadership. Um, and just one quick reminder uh, before we get going. On April 8th, Kevin James, history professor and chair for the Scottish Studies Foundation, at the University of Guelph, Ontario, will be joining us to discuss Victorian travelers in Scotland. So we hope you'll all be able to join in for that. And so now 
I, it's time to proceed with our presentation today. And we are so very excited to have Dr. Colin Nicholson, Professor of History and Politics at the University of Stirling, Scotland, and editor of the Bernard Papers, live from Stirling, who will discuss imaginary friendship, John Adams and Jonathan Siwa and their American Revolution, their American Revolution. And because I know we have a number of Revolutionary War era buffs on the phone, and you will be very interested in reading a couple of Collins books. So get out your pencil because I'm gonna read the, uh, the titles off to you. A couple of his recent books, the first being The Infamous Governor, Francis Bernard and the Origins of the American Revolution. And the second title being coincidentally, Imaginary Friendship in the American Revolution, John Adams and Jonathan Sewell. If you miss the title, shoot me an email and I'll get them to you. And Colin, uh, I think we're ready to turn the program over to you now. So, uh, and if you can tell us a wee bit about yourself, it would be grand. Thank you for being here. Well, before I share the screen and the slides, um, thanks for the invitation. As you probably gathered, I've been working on the American Revolution for most of my career, which began back in Boston in the mid-1980s. And I did begin originally to look at the Scottish Enlightenment and America, and subsequently moved into the study of the Loyalists, British policymaking, and so on. For the last 20 years, I've been working on Governor Francis Bernard, who's a major figure in the onset of the revolution, and editing for publication his public and private papers. The sixth and final volume, I am glad to say, is, has now been published and that project has come to an end. But along the way, I've been working on John Adams and it's also been my privilege to work with several postgraduates, including Phil Morong, who is here today, uh, who are also working on John Adams and they're the next generation in, in a sense. I am the past, but I want to draw your attention to John Adams now. I'm just about to share my screen, if that's okay. Could you just indicate if you can see that, somebody? Can you see that okay? Uh, we can see it. You just need to go to presentation view. Yes. Uh -huh. There we are. Thank you. And hello to one of your colleagues who I know is in Boston just now. This is a paper drawing upon my book, which I co-authored. And I've presented it before, and normally it requires four voices, two narrators, and two people who will quote from the source materials left by John Adams, of course, second US president, and Jonathan Sewell, a very prominent loyalist at the time of the revolution. But I'll do all four voices. I think it would be silly to try and uh, do otherwise. Let me take you back now first to 1787. Jonathan Sewell. While I was in London, my quondam friend, John Adams, made me a long, friendly visit. When Adams came in, he took my hand in both his, and with a hearty squeeze, accosted me in these words, how do you do, my dear old friend? Our conversation was just as might be expected at the meeting of two old, sincere friends after a long separation. Adams has a heart for friendship and susceptible of its finest feelings, he is humane, generous and open, warm in his friendly attachments, though perhaps rather implacable to those whom he thinks his enemies. I declare I would choose him in preference to all the men in the world for my fides accates in my projected asylum. John Adams. 1819. He always called me John, and I him Jonathan, and I often said to him, I wish my name were David. Friendship. To define it is to impose limits on its meanings, to historicize it is to imprison it within the probabilities that we allow. Friendship is easier to experience than to explain an element of pervasive relationship in human history. Every friendship is unique, and only the friends themselves can testify to the emotional intensity 
or value of that bond based on trust and intimacy. Friendship is most often remembered when lost or betrayed, as the case of Sewell and Adams of ours. And what it meant at moments in history and to whom is often puzzling. Primary friendships, those we value the most, in which we find moral value, or by which we judge all our friendships, we often casually depict as true friendship. Friendship is performative, and true friends invoke intuitive reactions. But how we represent true friendship is a work of the imagination, a crafted alterity, an existential visualization of the friendship, theorizing true friendship, as Adams and Sewell did, creates an imaginary friendship by idealizing the friendship's components, the self and the other, and the social context in which it operates. Imaginary friendship is not a fictive phenomenon, but an imaginative conceptualization and representation of the idea of true friendship, defining the friendship experienced. It's a gift to the self, capturing echoes of emotional intense uh, intimacy, deriving from the actual experience of friendship. But enough of the philosophy for now. The politics of friendship, how friendships operate, and political friendships, how they influence politics, are understudied by historians of the American Revolutionary Era, although we know a great deal about uh, friendship's nature and functionality in the 18th century. So today, 200 years or so later, I just want to explore the onset of the revolution through the prism of friendship examining the friendship and politics of future US President John Adams and prominent loyalist Jonathan Sewell. I offer a comparative biography exhibiting how Adams and Sewell consciously shaped each, other devel each other's development and how, what I'll explain to you, their intriguing quest to clean up colonial politics culminated in an extraordinary series of public letters published on the eve of the American Revolutionary War. Boston, 1774. John Adams presumed Jonathan Sewell to be the author of the most influential and intelligent loyalist tract of the American Revolution, written under the pseudonym Massachusettensis. The presumption influenced his own writings written in reply, collected as the letters of Novanglis. And in writing the Novanglis letters, John Adams became a revolutionary. His debate, his discussion, his dialogue even with Sewell took him on an intellectual journey that he might never have made on his own without imagining Jonathan Sewell to be the author of Massachusettensis. Adams chose independence, Sewell empire. The Adams Sewell imagined in London in 1787 was Adams he once believed he knew, a friend as faithful as Aeneas's shadowy henchman, Achetes in Virgil's Aeneid. Aeneid. Brave and wise, though seldom obtruding beyond his unswerving devotion to his reader. Jonathan Sewell, 1787, on John Adams. Sewell says, If Adams could but play backgammon, I believe he would soon find exile the happiest state. Domestic happiness, a snug house with a pretty farm. Jonathan Sewell was embarking on a loyalist odyssey. He left as a refugee, Boston. He ended up in Bristol, moved to London, back to Bristol, and was now, when he was meeting Adams and thinking of Adams, planning his own next and final move to New Brunswick in Canada. Sewell's imaginary friend was a private, amiable, sincere, intellectual campaign companion from long before the revolution. And so their meeting in 1787 was a source of nostalgic comfort. 
on the eve of another exile that would take him to New Brunswick. John Adams. In 1819, John Adams imagined his soul, his friendship with Sewell again. And it was no less heroic than a citation of the story of Jonathan and David, an obvious exemplar of a heroic male friendship from the Bible in memoriam to Sewell. And it had special meaning for himself and for history. As he declaimed in 1819, when the Nova Anglis and Massachusettenses essays were reprinted for publication. And here in 1819, Adams writes of that moment of 1774, when he found the Massachusetts Gazette teeming with political speculations and Massachusettenses shining like the moon among the lesser stars. I instantly knew him to be my friend Sewell and instantly resolved to enter the lists with him. In 1819, John Adams was rhapsodizing the moment in 1774 when he recognized Sewell's handiwork in the political letters Massachusettensis and how he commenced writing his own Novanglis letters with Sewell in mind. Now, by 1818, 1819, Adams had written open letters on the history of the American Revolution. And he offered now in this collection an elegy to his long departed. Sewell, who had died in 1796. And that elegy was written in the weeks of sorrow following the death of his wife, Abigail, his wife of 54 years. Recollection of literary combat with Massachusettensis on the very eve of the American Revolutionary War was a lonely return to scenes of past triumph with solace found in remembrance of domestic contentment with Abigail, Jonathan, and other friends. But no one knew that what Adams was telling them in 1819 was not strictly true. Massachusettensis was not written by Jonathan Sewell as Adams believed, and indeed as critics and friends soon discovered. They attributed the pamphlet to another loyalist and friend of both Sewell and Adams, Daniel Leonard. Now, most historians have accepted that designation thereafter, that Daniel Leonard was the sole author of Massachusettensis, which is the most influential and intellectually stimulating of all the loyalist pamphlets published at the time of the American Revolution. But John Adams never gave up on the assertion that his friend Jonathan Sewell had to some degree written Massachusettensis, whether as a sole or co-author. And what I did just a few years ago with colleagues was to undertake a, a computational linguistic analysis alongside textual analysis to try and establish authorship of these documents. And in fact, John Sewell and Daniel Leonard's um, are co-authors. So John Adams was right. And he was right to presume that Sewell had a role in the writing of Massachusettensis. Now, I'm going to return to that later on today and draw your attention to one or two things about this. But what I want to do now is to take you through the friendship of Jonathan Sewell and John Adams. And one of the great things that um, I found in, in study of, of this is it's very difficult to actually write histories of friendship. You know, all of us will pass through history and we leave records of one kind of another. Other people leave records about us. But one of the things that's often missing from that historical record is our friendships. Um, it's very rare indeed that we will, at any moment in time, start to theorize or start to memorialize, unless it's um, of deceased friends, rarely do we start to imagine the friendships that were and give them meaning. Rarely is it that we reflect upon them. But that's just what Adams and Sewell did at various stages in their lives. And that enabled me to construct a history of their friendship and use friendship as an analytical category to understand 
their uh, politics. Now, The story, such as it is, begins in 1759, but let me stress that the circumstances of the early encounters, both were lawyers, are less important than the promise of friendship itself. When they first met in early 1758, John Adams was 22, an aspiring lawyer teaching school. Jonathan Sewell, six years older, was already a practicing attorney. Intellectually, Adams yearned for the companionship of an intensity he realized Sewell could, could provide. It was an intellectual friendship. Dear sir, it gives him the most sensible pleasure to find my friend so becoming a resolution to persevere in the sublime study of the law. The formality of the salutation, dear sir, preserved Sewell's seniority. Being Sewell's friend, Adams had to prove his worth in the letter continued, the greatness of the task we have voluntarily set ourselves. I have found in you a fellow traveller who, if at any time through inattention, inability or ignorance, I should stop short or deviate, can and I doubt not will, kindly lend a helping hand and set me right. Now, Jonathan Sewell was crafting a Virgilian uh, fidesacates of the mind and did not expect to work too hard. And in reply, John Adams sketched an impossible regimen of self-education. They would together study law, rhetoric, mathematics, grammar, history, poetry, literature. John Adams to Jonathan Sewell, 1759. Now, to what higher object, to what greater character can any mortal aspire than to be possessed of all this knowledge, well digested and ready at command, to assist the feeble and friendless? to discountenance the haughty and lawless, to procure redress of wrongs, the advancement of rights, to assert and maintain liberty and virtue, to discourage and abolish tyranny and vice. Now, John Adams was offering to Sewell a proto-Republican creed, a credo even, that knowledge conveyed power and that power attained should be wielded for the benefit of the common weal. And the friendship, which we can reconstruct to some degree from letters, really did blossom. Six months later, Jonathan Sewell gently chided John Adams, not for his ambition, but for yearning to emulate the Roman advocate and statesman Marcus Tullius Cicero as a father of his country. Now, Sewell's Cicero was more cynical than Adams's idealism would allow. And historians have often thought this a mild rebuke of Adams's preoccupation with posthumous fame. But my own reading of this is that Sewell was seeking to inspire Adams to intellectual endeavour for its own sake. And of course, encouragement was what a true friend should supply. Cicero was John Adams' first and most enduring hero from history an obvious role model for aspiring barristers. His speeches were celebrated as exemplars of eloquent public speaking, worthy of emulation. Cicero was studied more as a rhetorician than a philosopher, and all of it held enduring appeal for John Adams to be and to become a father of his country, just like Cicero. And so in, with Sewell, Adams was finding Republican ideals, virtue, meritocracy, patriotism. And what they were embarking on too was a political friendship. Now, I won't go too much into the details of this, um, but Sewell, never oblivious to Adams's ambition, now started to exploit his knowledge and his friendship. And one of the things I discovered in the newspapers at the time were a series of letters from Adams and Sewell. Historians have known of them before, but now I was able to reread the letters knowing that uh, under pseudonyms, Sewell and John Adams were conducting dialogue in the Boston press. And what it revealed to me with Sewell's attempt here now to um, playfully um, and indeed dangerously um, play politics. And therefore, be it known to five asterisks, who else but John Adams? 
what he was offering here was, I think in retrospect now, a cruel ruse. And Sewell was likely aiming to enlist John Adams in a scheme to undermine one of the leading radicals of the emergent revolution in Boston in the mid 1760s, James Otis. And the scheme they came up with was a kind of double dealing to embarrass um, James Otis and then through that to curry favour with the governor, Francis Bernard, and the lieutenant governor, Thomas Hutchinson. Now, it was a strategy of considerable risk. And here emerges Jonathan Sewell as giving directions for Adams's political conduct. I came across a letter which historians had missed, which is in Canada, that details how Jonathan Sewell wants to plan John Adams's politics and how to use John Adams to expose James Otis and how to support the government side. Now, that letter Sewell carried with him from Cambridge, Massachusetts, in his case, to Boston, where he took refuge behind the British lines, from Boston when he left on 17th March, uh, when he left Boston in 1775 to London, then to Bristol, from Bristol back to London, and then to New Brunswick. It's one of a handful of personal letters that have survived and is in the Sewell family collections. It therefore means something. And yet there's no certainty that that letter was ever sent. But what it does reveal is the extent to which Jonathan Sewell and John Adams are playing a dangerous political game in the mid 1760s. Had John Adams's gamesmanship been exposed at that time, then I can guarantee that you would never have heard of John Adams, the second US president, and his political and indeed public career as a barrister, which had only just, they had only just begun, would have been well and truly over. It was a dangerous game they were playing here. Now, I can explain a little bit more later if you want, but the friendship as it develops, therefore, is one that will take various twists and turns through the 1760s and 1770s. And in John Adams's uh, correspondence in his uh, diary, even we can see snippets of that and we must retain the notion here of Adams and Sewell playing not just a dangerous political game, but one that um, reveals a great deal about how their friendship is indeed influencing um, the uh, politics of the revolution. Had I but known thee, three years ago, John Adams wrote in 1763, I would have seen thee gizzarded. He is um, deeply hurt and angered by Sewell's politics. By 1772, he recalls, 11 years ago, I thought him the best friend I had in the world. But now, God forgive him for the part he has acted, both in his public and private life. And yet, Adams's friendship with Sewell, he memorialized. That friendship, he recalled in 1819, had reached its zenith in the summer of 1774, when on the very eve of revolution, he recounted the conversation he had with John Sewell at Falmouth while on court circuit. And Adams's memory of being with Sewell burned all the brighter in 1819, for it was the last time they were together as friends before the war. Adams's version, we do not have Sewell's, gave his friends the word, Great Britain is determined on her system, her power, and will be irresistible and certainly destructive. We cannot say whether Sewell was putting a lawyer's argument in personal terms, and the evidence shows Sewell a colder man than Adams, and he probably meant exactly what he said and implied, or at least what Adams said he said. 
And so Adams believed, remembering his own reply, as the die is now cast. I have passed the Rubicon, sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish with my country. My unalterable determination. Now, the mixture of metaphors indicates some authenticity. Adams was coming up with a slightly ridiculous analogy, liking himself to Caesar crossing the Rubicon and thus placing himself in rebellion against Pompey's Rome and thence from the little Rubicon to a river capable of drowning him. And he was probably thinking of Cassius's description in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar of Caesar sinking in the Tiber and so on and so on. But Etu Brute would, in John Adams's mind, have been an appropriate sentiment for either Sewell or himself at that moment of choosing country over friend. And Adams in 1819 gave himself the last line in that conversation as he recalled it. I see we must part, Adams wrote. With a bleeding heart, I say, I fear forever. But you may depend upon it. This adieu is the sharpest thorn on which I ever set my foot. He would not have forgotten the words of that farewell. And again, the mix of metaphors indicates integrity all the more as the exhausted cliche of the bleeding heart was subordinated to the very natural memory of the thorn in the foot of the brain tree boy. Now, they parted and in 1774, Adams was off to the Continental Congress. Resistance in Massachusetts became rebellion. Sewell joined the other loyalists in Boston. And with court work much reduced, Sewell was co-opted by the British commander-in-chief as a private secretary and likely directed the loyalist propaganda working with Daniel Leonard on Massachusettensis. And so John Adams responded in the Boston Gazette with his own series of letters, Novanglas, written directly in response to Massachusetts and on the assumption that Massachusettensis was written by his friend, Jonathan Sewell. Now, I won't go into the details, but we have been able to establish um, Sewell and Leonard working on a series of letters or working independently, and John Adams beginning now to um, respond. And what we have here is a fairly complex debate emerging, uh, whereby John Adams um, as Novanglis and Sewell and Leonard as Massachusettensis are beginning to debate um, questions of treason, of sovereignty, arguing about the extent to which Parliament was supreme or not in the American colonies, arguing, as John Adams put it, for the right of revolution. And in those last few letters written and published in the days just before the commencement of hostilities at Lexington and Concord on the prospect, the very real prospect of British conquest and what it would mean to John Adams and other Americans. And so I reread that debate on the assumption that uh, John Adams constructed his arguments to reply directly to his former friends, Leonard and Sewell. Now, that contributes a great deal, I think, to Adams's political thought, which has been thoroughly examined, as you might ex expect. But now I'm introducing this interpersonal dimension uh, to try and interpret how the writing itself follows some of the um, friendship. Now, I won't go through it in too much detail, but I'll offer you one or two hints of what I did here. Um, John Adams began his first Novanglis letter writing in direct response to the third Massachusettensis. Now, um, Adams believed those opening lines in that third letter were for him. John Sewell had written, to undertake to convince a person of his error is indisputable duty, the certain though dangerous test of friendship. Now, this is Cicero and this is Sewell being Ciceronian explaining what his duty is, which is to try and convince his friend John Adams of the danger of pursuing revolutionary politics. Now, Adams has spied in reply an actual friend at work. And the impact of Massachusettensis first two letters probably convinced them that he had better be the man who answered it because Massachusettensis was by far the most able 
and, as it turned out, influential of all the Loyalist letters. Now, of course, before Adams could begin his task, he needed to identify his antagonist. His public life had been one of debate in the law courts, where the cases to be determined and their ultimate outcome were constantly permeated by strengths and weaknesses of opponents. And John Adams was all too aware that the outcome in this case could be one of utter disaster for himself, his family, and his political friends. Now, did claiming intention to confront Massachusetts tensus, John Adams then began to engage in an attempt, as it were, to rescue Sewell from loyalism. And certainty in knowing who his opponent was gave Adams a tactical edge. And so therefore, Massachusetts tensus had to ponder how much familiarity would inflame or restrain John Adams. Now, the debate continued. Um, and there are all kinds of friendship references here, uh, references to their actual friendship and references to friendship itself. And so the political argument um, uh, can be, again, reinterpreted or re-understood as an argument between actual friends. And when they eventually um, engaged in direct uh, debate, um, John Sewell and Daniel Leonard began to throw back at John Adams some of the more famous words that he had already uh, used. For example, um, during the Boston Massacre trials, um, John Adams are used in defense of the, um, the British uh, officer and soldiers uh, but trying to defend them. He declared before the court, these are stubborn facts, etc. cetera. Um, we must put them out of our, uh, we must only address um, stubborn facts. But of course, here you have Leonard and Sewell throwing back at John Adams, the words that they knew that he'd used during that um, trial. And there are all kinds of other um, friendship references that um, we can uh, identify. Here, here are just a, a couple here. Um, the debate um, ranged over um, British sovereignty, but the fundamental issue at stake for uh, John Adams in the dialogue now with um, Massachusettensis was uh, the following question, one that we term in the book, uh, the British question. The fundamental issue was whether we, um, the American colonies, are part of the kingdom of Great Britain. Now, from this intellectual departure point, John Adams developed the argument for colonial legislative autonomy within empire. Now, he hasn't gone yet to, to argue for independence. Very few colonists would until the onset of um, conflict in April 1775. But Adams started to scrutinize the constitutional histories of Massachusetts, England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, and began to dismantle the apparatus binding Americans and Britons. And he began to advance the doctrine of parallel sovereignty. And that was his most distinctive contribution to revolutionary ideology uh, to date, one he developed in uh, debate and dialogue with uh, Massachusettensis. Now they traded personal insults as well, as you might expect. Um, they traded ideas, they traded suggestions, and they traded um, direct uh, references to their past. Here, for example, is John Adams saying, I wish no Vanglis's memory had served him better. Remember the friendship, remember what they talked about. Here is Massachusettensis acknowledging the friendship dimension. I have sometimes quarreled with my friends, he wrote, and it's painful to give a recollection to that. But truth must prevail, the loyalist argued. So in amongst all those friendship references, we began to see two uh, antagonists um, conducting debate and dialogue that is drawn upon their actual friendship and their actual experience of political friendship, each trying to persuade the other that their course of action, which they had embarked, 
was wrong, each trying to save the other from what they regarded has been certain destruction. But it's Adams's last part that really roused Massachusettensis now to address him. Now, the actual friendship with Sewell certainly complicated the writing of these pamphlets and certainly is complicated, um, I suppose, the interpretation I've now given you. But what I want you just to take away here is that Sewell is an omnipresent imaginary friend in John Adams's mind when he's developing his most distinctive argument with regard to revolutionary ideology, that the American colonies are not part of the British Empire, their personal dominions of the king outside the realm. They've never been annexed, they've never been conquered, and therefore they're not subject to parliamentary authority. Now, for Adams to voice that and to develop that argument in 1775 meant that he was walking close to his grave. He was um, potentially um, open to treasonable actions if the British were prepared to go that far. And he also knew, I think, that one day he might well have to defend in court uh, those seeking independence if Sewell and others, as they did, advised the British to prosecute leading radicals for treason. The arguments that Adam therefore, Adams therefore developed um, were certainly constitutional, certainly political, but also um, had a very strong personal element to try and save Sewell, as he thought, from the destruction that would follow. Now, the phony war, characterized by the debate I've just outlined for you, came to an end at Lexington on the 19th of April, 1775. And riding the road from his home in Braintree to Lexington uh, the next day, Adams found, quote, great confusion and much distress with, as he put it, the poison of Massachusettensis having ceased as if it was another um, Rubicon. And so Adams then and later talked of Rubicons, of dice, of poisons, and in a way like his literary hero, Brutus, in uh, Shakespeare's um, Julius Caesar, he resolved to confront Caesar's tyranny, the tyranny of the British. Now, in fact, the benign appearance and corrupt reality of royal government echoes Brutus's logic in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And the Brutus-Caesar friendship was all too relevant to John Adams and his conviction that Sewell was Massachusettensis spouting Caesar's propaganda. And Sewell and Leonard were choosing empire over friendship. But to the author of Novanglis, it was an attempt here to warn his country as well of impending conquest. And that conquest is the subject of that last letter. Now, the reunion that I mentioned at the very beginning snatched their friendship from obscurity. And their comments on its intellectual strength, on its um, idealization, exhibit, of course, the radicalization of Adams and the loyalism now of, of Sewell. We have captured memorializations in references to David and Jonathan and so on of that friendship too. Um, and perhaps in the end, uh, on the very eve of that war, resemblance to Brutus's fateful choices in rebelling against Caesar um, were always at the back of John Adams's mind. And for us, um, I would conclude just with one line, that friendship was always in Adams's heart and mind and should be always in historians whenever they read their historical records. Thank you very much. Okay, well, bravo, bravo. That, that was spectacular, Colin. What an extraordinary journey John Adams experienced, he and Sewell. 
And um, I'd like to open the floor to questions and comments for Dr. Nicholson now, please. And please don't be shy. And Jack, if you'll turn on everybody's microphones and cameras, I think while, uh, Phil, did you have a question? Yes, please. Yes, yes please. Uh, since the, 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 the theme of Dr. Nicholson's talk was friendship, Adam, John Adams's friendship, uh, could you tell us more about John Adams's friendships in terms of network when he was president, for example, you know, the Kwanzaa War? How, how, how did he use his friendships? That's a very interesting question, Philippe, and you're the one who's going to answer this eventually <laughs> rather than me. Um, John Adams had very few friends, and Sewell's depiction of a man whose heart is formed for friendship is certainly in relation to the friendship that they enjoyed. But one of the things that's very clear to me um, in study of Adams, and certainly by the 1790s, um, it took a great deal to become John Adams's friend. As you know, he was detached from politics, famously depicted by one historian as a party of one. He trusted few. And the intimacy, the, um, the trust displayed in his friendship with Sewell marks out as a primary friendship. And I think what we know from the study of friendship, modern friendship in particular, we probably only have about four or five friends in our lives who we judge all other friendships by, probably because of the degrees of trust and intimacy and so forth, not just proximity. Um, and we value these above all others. And I would say Adams had about four or five others. Now, historians would like to think Thomas Jefferson was one of them. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I think uh, Adams measured his friendship with Jefferson with reference to his friendship with Sewell. Um, by the time you get into the 1790s, Adams has made deep and lasting friendships with people whom he once distrusted. Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts was one of them. There is some reconciliation, as you know, with Thomas Jefferson later on, but it, it's not, not quite the same. Um, there are one or two others that um, in the 1780s that now fall off Adams' uh, um, friendship radar. James Warren, I'm not sure how much you know about James Warren, um, he is a Plymouth lawyer, and the politics of friendship is important because uh, James and, more importantly, his wife, Mercy Otis, are anti-federalists and, and begin to dislike Adams's uh, federalism. So by the time you get into 1790s, Adams's uh, overt political friendships with those around him are very few indeed, a handful. But, the big but throughout his presidency, as you well know, Abigail Adams is his principal political friend. And this is the, also as I'm sure you know, that the great political partnership. And that flowers in the 1790s, certainly during the presidency. Um, at what point did Abigail become his confidante? Probably 1775. Um, she probably pushed him a little bit more than revolution. That friendship is in abeyance during his time in Europe and then is restored when they're reunited in the mid-1780s. But it's not really until the 1790s that Abigail now emerges as the main primary political friend. They are well and truly engaged in, in a partnership. It's a very long answer to your question. The short answer, very few indeed, and you could count them in one hand. <laughs> um, Dr. Nicholson, during this period of the American Revolution era, a number of political leaders uh, donned pseudonyms of ancient philosophers and great rulers and published anonymous political views in the newspapers and journals of the time. I wonder if you might uh, elaborate on this practice overall, um, which I think was probably a source of both information and entertainment for the readers of the newspapers and journals. Yeah, first I would say the adoption of, of a pseudonym is um, formulaic. It, it's a way, of course, to, to appear to separate the private from the public. 
Um, and it also gives you some cover, um, some plausible deniability. That, that's fair enough. Secondly, um, it's occasionally a game, but more often than not, the convention is such that you adopt a pseudonym and you stick with it throughout your, um, I wouldn't say entire political career, but for a period of time. And you try to be fairly distinctive. Now, you do have people adopting some, some obvious uh, pseudonyms, um, but as well as providing you cover and as well as you know being some kind of convention, it, it allows you to say things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to say publicly. And that, this is where the cover becomes very playful here. I'll give you an example in a minute. And so therefore you can begin um, to, to prod and to antagonize. You begin to write, you send signals and you deliver codes Sometimes you know your messages are going to be understood. Sometimes they're going to be misunderstood. Now, the point I'm getting at, the third thing I would make, is that the deliberate choice of a pseudonym is to send um, a signal to those around you. It's provocative. It's not just convention. It's not just providing cover. Jonathan Sewell wrote as philanthrop, a uh, lover of humanity. He also wrote under a whole series of other uh, pseudonyms that had Phil Ann in the, um, the, the pseudonym itself. Now, that became a way uh, of um, letting your readership know who you were, um, even though you wouldn't disclose that your name is Jonathan Sewell. So every time John Adams came across Philanthrop or one of its um, variations, he knew that it was Sewell, and they therefore assumed that Sewell was writing under that pseudonym in order to send a signal. Hence the public debate. The private debate then became a public debate under pseudonym. So it's not um, just convention, it's not just a means of cover, it's not just plausible deniability, it's a game. And that's the the intriguing thing um, and following the clues are um, something that historians can do pretty well, I think, if they take the time. It requires a great deal of investment of effort. The publishers must have uh, um, observed a great deal of discretion, though, in not revealing the identities of ah, the writers. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the thing. One of the uh, issues that certainly faced American revolutionaries, uh, take the publisher of the Boston Gazette, Benjamin um, Eads and John Gill. Um, Eads was a, a son of liberty and therefore um, could, in theory, have been prosecuted for seditious libel by the um, government of the day in Massachusetts or indeed the British Crown. So again, um, not knowing what is said offers some um, cover, but of course it's responsibility of the printers uh, as well. So they could have been pursued um, as well as the authors. Um, but generally speaking, what you have certainly in Boston, but it's not the same in all the uh, colonial cities, but in Boston, you've got um, a handful of newspapers competing for a very small readership. So it's a real tough economy there and they're prepared to take contributions from all sides. So it wouldn't make economic sense just to limit it to one side or another, even though the Boston Gazette was a very partisan uh, newspaper, a revolutionary newspaper. Oh, that answers your question. I kind of went off a, on a detour there, sorry. No, no, very, very, very interesting. Thank you. I have a question uh, about the documentation. Where, how did it survive? such a long time and where were they being kept? Yeah, that, 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 that's a, a fascinating problem there. I refer to a letter that Jonathan Sewell had written and this is 1763. And it was addressed, the salutation is friend John. And when you read that document, it's pretty obvious if you know your stuff, if you know your your history, that it's written for John Adams and all kinds of references. But John Adams' papers, also in, in Boston, the Massachusetts Historical Society, doesn't contain the receiver's copy. There's no original that Adams received. So therefore, we don't know for sure if that document was ever sent 
or if it's just a copy of something that was sent. All we know for sure, um, uh, William, is that this document was so valuable that Sewell took it with him everywhere on his Odyssey. In fact, it's only one of five documents from the pre-revolutionary period that survived. How did it survive is your question. Who knows? All we know is that Sewell must have taken great care to ensure its survival. And it now is in um, the National Archives of Canada, uh, the original. Um, so um, the other things that have survived or not, we've only got um, 10 to 11, there's some doubt about one of them, pieces of correspondence in draft or in full original form as letters between Adams and Sewell. So given that, plus the letters that we have between Massachusettsensis and Novanglis that are published writings, plus the letters that appeared in the Boston press when they conducted the debate and dialogue in the mid 1760s, we've actually got quite a lot of material um, to try and reconstruct the friendship. Um, but the big point I was making at the beginning, you know, I don't know if you think about it in your own lives, but it's very, very rare, except at funerals or some other memorialization, that you recall the friendship, theorize what it means to you, and then write about it. But Adams and Sewell were doing that through the 60s, the 70s. And then when I opened with that statement from Jonathan Sewell of when he met John Adams in London, after an absence of, you know, 15 years, then they start to compare themselves to figures from um, um, Virgil's Aeneid, figures from the Bible, David and Jonathan, Brutus and um, Caesar. And all of that is a way in which an 18th century gentleman would start to theorize and make sense of friendship. And the knowledge of that from my perspective in the 21st century therefore enables me to reinterpret their political friendships um, in a very different way and it's micro history and my is it fulfilling and satisfying Oof. it's really um it's detailed stuff but you begin to to um really enjoy that work of detection as a historian um it's that, that book is, is the thing I've enjoyed most in my entire academic career, I have to say. I, I have some personal uh, connection to this. I grew up in Quincy, Massachusetts. At the time, it was called Braintree. And uh, going to grammar school, I'd walk past the homestead of John Adams and John Quincy Adams. And of course, we went to the Adams Grammar School. And uh, very close to that was. Uh, Abigail Adams and John Quincy Adams watched the Bunker Hill battle from that uh, hill right near the school, and they could see the smoke from the battle of uh, Bunker Hill. There's a lovely uh, note in their exchange when I think one of them is describing the view across Boston Harbor from the position that you've just uh, mentioned there. I can't be sure of it, but there are one or two references to time and place. You're probably aware that, that Jonathan, Sewell, Jonathan Sewell's house in Brattle Street, Cambridge, is still standing. It's very much occupied today. And I did think about beginning with the illustrations of the photographs of the, you know, the, the president's homesteads in, in Quincy alongside Sewell's house and, and Tory Row, as it was then called, um, facetiously um, by the Americans. In, in Cambridge, but I didn't bother with that, yeah. You know, Professor Nicholson, I'll speak up again. Um, Governor Francis Bernard was another very interesting political leader in Boston during the American Revolution era and a historic figure who you've also researched and published on. I wonder if you'd care to comment on Bernard for the group, because he was really a very integral part of all of this politics. Okay, sure. And I'll try and connect him with the Sewell and Adam's story. Francis Thanks. Bernard was governor for nine years and his significance here is that he's the man 
who sends reports back to London and the British government of what the American colonists are getting up to. His letters are then read in cabinet by ministers, by the king, and then they're then presented to parliament. And they constitute the main body of evidence on which the British uh, government is seeking to justify its American policy up to the early 1770s. And then they're used by ministers to justify some of the more coercive measures, including the actual intolerable acts, the coercive acts of 1774. Barnard, um, brought Jonathan Sewell into the administration as the Attorney General. And to Francis Bernard, Jonathan Sewell was a shining star of that administration, clever, articulate, and a brilliant legal mind. It fell to Jonathan Sewell, in theory, to prosecute um, John Hancock for evasions of the trade laws. And um, the prosecution of John Hancock in 19... 1768-69 was one of the most controversial legal trials, um, but it was abandoned, and it was abandoned because Jonathan Sewell couldn't get evidence that Francis Bernard thought would be uh, sufficient to procure a conviction. Now, um, at this point in time, John Adams is the province's most, um, I would say, uh, active and successful barrister. And Francis Bernard, the governor, is trying to eye another um, able lawyer to join the team. And he asks Jonathan Sewell to try and persuade John Adams to join the government. He tries to buy him. Again, um, you would not have had Adams as a president had Sewell persuaded John Adams to join the administration. The time you get to 1770, John Adams is defending the British soldiers accused of murder in the Boston Massacre trials. In theory, Jonathan Sewell should have been the Crown Prosecutor, okay? Mm -hmm. Sewell chose to be absent. Sewell did not prosecute. Someone else stepped in. So here you had that wonderful opportunity in 1770 for two friends to contest the now most controversial trial in American history, the prosecution of soldiers. And one decided not to do it, not to join in. Of course, Adams gets the soldiers off. So in his mind, and in Sewell's mind, I think, too, when they start to debate the revolution in 1774, 1775, it's almost as if it's a continuation of the debates in the press but it's the fulfillment of a public debate that they never actually had in the Boston Massacre trials. So um, that's that background um, to that. So the, the pair of them have a great deal of history um, and, and history that, that in a sense uh, of events that never took place. And, and at the time, um, perhaps looking back uh, from 1819, Adams wished that they had have had that chance. Yeah, in reading your book, I um, while I think um, Sewell really did consider uh, the friendship to be imaginary or feigned, especially later on in the in the relationship, I, I always had the impression that Adams really did feel real love for Sewell and and uh, cherished the friendship and was very disappointed when it ended. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, I think that, that is accurate. Adam, Adams, um, Sewell's depiction of Adams as having a heart formed for friendship um, equates with what we know of John Adams' um, very close friendships with others in his life, including for a while Thomas Jefferson. There's a trust uh, and an intimacy that enable the friends to discuss the big issues of the debate of, of the day. And for Adams and Jefferson, it's the constitutional future of the United States. Um, and that is the thing that, that, that really interests, interests me. Um, Adams, um, I don't like a psychology and history because I'm, I'm not a psychologist. And we, we, we need to speak to our, our subjects um, to, to, to do that. But the um, Adams emerges as someone who is a very intense friend 
and someone who invests a great deal in the friendship. And when it's broken, as in the case of Sewell, as in the case even of Thomas Jefferson, it is extremely hurtful. Um, but he is very um, cautious uh, about that investment in that particular friend and, and these particular friendships, which is why Adams only has about four or five of them, um, fewer than that even, in his life. Um, Sewell and Jefferson have been are two of them. Abigail preeminently, and uh, Elbridge Gerry is the other. And there are one or two others along the way. Um, but um, we can see in Adams's papers and his diaries uh, the extent to which he is investing a great deal of time, effort, um, emotional, but above all, intellectual. What Adams yearns for with Sewell is an intellectual friendship. And it's pretty clear early on they find that in the study of law, history, and that friendship breaks over politics, not just because they're on different sides, but because Jonathan Sewell tries to manipulate John Adams um, politically, and Adams is having none of it. Um, had Sewell been successful, as I said earlier, you never would have heard of John Adams. Gus Noble, I believe Gus has his hand up. Gus? Well, maybe maybe he's distracted. You know, Colin, you've mentioned Thomas Jefferson a couple of times, and I would personally love it if you would comment on that relationship, uh, particularly I know when they were in, in their elder years and, you know, D John asked Thomas who should write the history of the revolution and so forth. Would you please elaborate on that for us? Sure. Um, the personal friendship of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams was formed at the Second Continental Congress in 1775. Uh, Adams is much older than Jefferson and Jefferson sees in John Adams um, someone who is committed to um, independence um, and both belong to the vanguard of the independence movement and they're there uh, rather than advance of some of the more moderate delegates from New York or Pennsylvania or further south. But the friendship really uh, became a, a primary friendship when they're uh, in, in uh, France as emissaries uh, for the uh, Confederation for the Congress at war. And then laterally in London, when uh, Jefferson comes across in 1785, uh, 86, when Adams is minister to Great Britain, the first minister. And there, uh, uh, Abigail, John, and Thomas Jefferson form a very close uh, friendship. Now, it was broken by politics around 1800, 1801, when uh, Thomas Jefferson um, denied um, having um, published and sponsored publication of a series of tracts that denigrated John Adams's presidency, Thomas Jefferson lied to the Adamses and the knowledge that the then by 1801 president had lied, Thomas Jefferson really uh, rendered the friendship asunder, but uh, they had been grown apart politically through the 1780s and 1790s and were only friends in name at the point in time, 1801, when the friendship, the personal friendship was broken and the Adamses were deeply hurt. Uh, by the denial um, that uh, he had um, given information to Adams's critics. But the friendship was renewed um, in 1811, uh, largely at the prompting <clears throat> of um, Abigail, who'd written to Thomas Jefferson, that kind of smoothed the way for reconciliation. She was deeply hurt uh, by Thomas Jefferson, and partly because their friendship, Abigail and Thomas, really was deep and long lasting and, and very liberating in many respects. Um, I won't go into that uh, in any, any further detail, um, but um, Benjamin Rush and one or two others were also um, prompting Adams to, to take the initiative and eventually he, he did write to Thomas Jefferson. And then emerges one of the great literary correspondences of American life and the exchange of letters is just phenomenal all the way up to the, you know 1826. And as you know, both will die on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in, in 1826. 
Um, and it's the things that discuss history, among other things. John Adams was too old to write History of the Revolution. I think it was something that he would have liked to have been able to do. Which is why in 1819, he was very happy when a publisher approached him to suggest that they reissue the Massachusetts Novanglis letters as an exhibit of that past, of that revolutionary past. And um, he warmed to that. And when he was writing the preface for um, this, um, he was thinking about the history of the revolution. He was thinking about the fact that these old, older uh, men and women are, are, are passing, taking with them their tales, their stories, the things they know. Uh, but of course, he would began that um, just weeks after the death of Abigail. And so you can imagine the emotion running through the act of writing and in remembrance, thinking of Abigail, of, of Jonathan Sewell, of Thomas Jefferson, and all that stuff would have been going through his mind. Now, we don't have any documentary of evidence all that we must assume it's taken place it's a sorrowful time so here we see adams um remembering uh, memorializing reimagining theoret theorizing the friendships that was that were sorry um wow it's quite a story uh, when you, you you put all that uh, that together uh, and so for, for adams then the history of the American Revolution that he would have liked to have written, a more standard, you know, kind of documentary-based history is no longer possible. What he's writing is a history that is personal, that is laden with emotion, um, as you might expect. Um, does Thomas Jefferson do the same thing? No, I think. But what you might want to do is, at some point in your lives, if fellow historians, um, you might want to read um, Andrew Bernstein's book, The Inner Jefferson. It's a fabulous piece of history where he, he starts to cover this, the things that I've mentioned just in the last five minutes with regard to John Adams. And as one historian, thinking of how historians write friendships, it's a fabulous book that was published. In the, um, he began that work as a PhD dissertation, but it's a really fabulous. Andrew Burstein, B-U-R Stein. Marvellous piece of work, um, The Inner Jefferson. Other comments, discussion? I guess a comment, I guess a comment would be uh, Dr. Nicholson speaking to those letters between Jefferson and Adams. Uh, as you probably have read, there was quite an exchange between the two after Abigail's death. Yes, it continued. And, and, and just a couple of impressionistic points. And um, she will die in, in, in October 1818. And um, the correspondence between Jefferson and, and uh, Adams will range up until this point and after this point over all manner of things. Um, as I mentioned. But it certainly becomes deeply personal. Um, aside from the offers of condolences that Jefferson will make, um, there is a... It's For me, it's what's not discussed that's actually quite intriguing. And there are references, for example, to, to slavery, to enslavement. There are references to other things. Um, on which they had long disagreed. And so here, here you have the avoidance of discussion in order not to perhaps sully the memory of the good times that they spent in friendship in the 1780s and so on, before politics uh, rendered uh, that friendship uh, null and void, I think. Uh, from 1818 all the way through to the 1826, you then begin to see a turn. Um, the friendship um, recalled is still there. It's not that the letters from 1818, and they do become fewer, it's still substantial, but they do fall off. It's not that they um, avoid substantive issues, but it's, it's. I think that they're avoiding the things that are too hurtful for them to actually discuss. And that for me is, is in the end, one of the most intriguing. Now, 
as a historian, what I would say, excuse me, um, there have been a couple of attempts to write the history of uh, Jefferson and, and Adams through their letters. The most recent was by Gordon Wood uh, in a book called Friends Divided. Very good book. But Wood didn't take friendship as an analytical category and apply it to the sources. No, that's, that's for him to do. Um, and what I'm, I'm saying is that sometimes somebody's going to have to do that and to do it really well. Uh, it won't be me. Um, but someone uh, needs to do it. The interesting thing was uh, John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, became the sixth president of the United States. And uh, he also, after his presidency, became a representative of Massachusetts, which was very unusual to uh, step down from the presidency to be in the House of Representatives. Indeed, that, I mean, what, there's a um, recent publication, which I haven't read, Andrew Bernstein is a co-author, it's next on, on a very long list of things to read, and it's a study of the President's Adams in uh, tackling um, what, what the author, authors call the problem of democracy, and here you have father and son debating a democratic future for the United States and what it means. And that conversation begins in the home as well as in the public forum. And I'm really looking forward to, to, to looking out to reading that book. And um, there's been much work on John Adams's political thought in recent years that um, considers the ways in which he evaluates the, the and deals with the problems of oligarchy. Uh, in relationship to, to democracy. Um, these are really important contributions to American historiography. And uh, the best uh, work is by a former editor of the Adams papers, Richard Ryerson, who looks at the evolution of John Adams as Republican thought. And Adams's reputation is that really of a thinker, you know, it's in letters, uh, not in books. Adams doesn't write um, big books, um, nothing that's that significant. Um, what he does produce is a compendium of constitutional excerpts from Americans, but it's in letters such as those with Jefferson that Adams will work out some of the really important issues and explore some of the big problems uh, facing the um, emergent United States. And I suspect that the co-authors of the new um, um, book on the President's Adams will deal with that issue at, at length. I haven't had the chance yet to, to read that book. What was uh, John Adams' uh, attitude toward slavery? Um, it's complex. Let me give you another example, um, uh, because it had to be. Um, and um, one of the things I'm working on just now is John Adams's role as minister to Great Britain in the 1780s. And I'm looking at uh, some of the uh, sticking points, um, diplomatically speaking. Uh, one of the big issues was the failure of the United States to return to British slaveholders, um, fugitives. Um, they were obliged under the Treaty of Paris to return enslaved folks to uh, loyalists and to British officers. Um, one of the things I've been doing in the last few weeks is reading Adams's account of his discussions with leading British statesmen and his audience with King George III. And it's pretty clear that John Adams is not prepared um, to abandon in theory, the commitment under the Treaty of 1783 that the United States were obliged to return fugitives to Great Britain. So secondly, personally, it still needs to be done in a systematic, methodical fashion to go through and to plot uh, all Adams's references to enslavement one way or another. Thirdly, it's pretty clear from his correspondence with Jefferson and his correspondence with others that Adams, um, like his son, uh, John Quincy, detested slavery, as you might imagine. And as you know, um, fourthly, Adams is the only finding uh, father in whatever list you want, not to have been a slaveholder at one time of his life. But what I'm saying to you is that's not the point. Um, we can see in John Jonathan Sewell's family history, um, the Sewells were slaveholders like 
many elite um, Massachusetts uh, families. But um, Sewell and John Adams, in their legal notes, exchange ideas and uh, make um, a case for um, folk who are now trying to escape slavery to, to sue for their freedom. So what I'm saying to you, William, is basically the, 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 the case is really very complex indeed and needs to be looked at in a great more detail than hitherto and then we'll see a much more complex um, um i suppose answer to your question it's not not straightforward right. other discussion questions commentary hmm. donald Ex excellent program excellent It really, really was. It really was. Well, we're, we're getting close to adjournment. So anybody else here at the end? Okay, well, and I would like to say hello to Caroline Craycraft. Colin, uh, Caroline was the former vice consul at the uh, British consulate here in Chicago. Thank you for joining Caroline. We're always happy to see you. And thanks to all the governors who were on today. So um, we just can't thank you enough, Professor Nicholson, for joining us today. This has been enlightening and interesting and fabulous in every way. And we will look forward to your next speaking engagement in 2024. So <laughs> he raised his eyebrows. But uh, uh, we'll be chasing after you for that. And Gus, uh, I just want to thank you for being on with us today. And Jack Sanders, thanks for all you do for us. And friends, my gosh, thank you so much for being with us month after month. And I know we lost a few today because of these St. Patrick's Day parades, which I don't know why they're having them on the 11th. But uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Same time, same station. And until then, be safe. And thank you. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Connie and everyone. Um, can, can I just also introduce... I'll call you in about half an hour. Yes, we're going to have another introduction. I'll, yes, please. I'll call you, thank you. I'm just, can I just introduce Tim Cook, who, who is from Hawaii, who, who is a, who's looking very relaxed. And, uh, and nice to see you, Tim. Um, and, uh, oh, there, me. Tim. Well, Tim, you had your hand up a while ago. Did you have a question? Because then your face disappeared. I was going to call on you. Did you have a point to make? Well, I was going to ask Colin uh, if he knew uh, of any other contemporaneous fr uh, notable friendships amongst some of the other movers and shakers around uh, the colonies. Uh, Henry Lawrence comes to mind and, and some others. Obviously, he knows my, my focus is on the southern colonies, but uh, I just wondered if he was aware of any other similar friendships. Yes. Um there's a very good book um, by a young uh, British scholar um, which looks at Alexander Hamilton's uh, various friendships, including with um, members of the, the Lawrence family. And I think that's one that, that's well worth uh, following up. Uh, and you might want to have a look at some of the, the work by other historians. Richard Godbeer has looked at friendship uh, per se, and there's a, um, another historian, um, who and in fact it's on the, on the, the slides that I looked at. Who's looking at emotion? So some of, what you'll find is that in many of those histories, you're going to be able to look at some very detailed friendships that are, are constructed. But for, for purposes of comparison, Alexander Hamilton first. Why Hamilton? Why the founding fathers and their, um, so on? Because they've left the evidence and the collection of their state papers and private papers enables us in theory as historians to reconstruct the network friendships, not just the primary friendships that operated within uh, all of those families. Um, so you think of Hamilton and Jefferson and Washington and so on, the Adams as, as being like a nub, you know, a node as it were. And the friendship networks that can be established from their papers um, would run into the hundreds. And so it's a valuable collections of material that you can use to study 
and friendships. So what I'm saying to you in short, Tim, is um, yeah, there's one or two around that's well worth looking at. That's not a problem. I'm going to enable you to construct it. But historians have got a wonderful opportunity to do this even in much more depth. He's just delving out assignments to everyone in every direction. <laughs> okay, well, bravo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Being adjourned. Thank you.